I know it's a long one, and I, I do hope that you've watched to the end. Thank you. We'll keep you posted. Okay, friends. <clears throat> My voice sounds like this. I've done a lot of talking today. You might think, like, what does that have to do with it? You do a lot of talking every day. I do, however, um, I haven't been sleeping very much. What sleep I have been getting has been kind of crappy because there's been a lot of stress and panic lately just about what's happening with our sweet Lush Kaboom. So I'm here to discuss how our appointment went with the neurosurgeon and neurologist today. So Peter and I made a huge list of questions I'm on the weekend. Uh, for reference, it's Wednesday, the 28th of February. Peter did not go into work in the morning as our appointment was for nine. So we got everybody ready to go. We dropped Casper off at school. We dropped Augie off at daycare because it's a normal day for everybody else. And then we drove to the hospital in London. This is where Felix had his first surgery. So it was sort of like a deja vu kind of situation, only it's worse now. I don't know if it's worse because like, we already made it through that hump of the first surgery and things have just gotten progressively worse. Like there was a lull where things were pretty good and then it's, it's just increased. So luckily, luckily, Peter managed to get a video of Felix having a really, really bad seizure this morning. And we were able to show it to both the neurologist and the neurosurgeon. We didn't go through our questions like kind of on a, like a one by one basis, like ask a question, get an answer. It was sort of like an organic discussion about kind of what the plan is. They talked a lot about whether or not to go ahead with a two-stage surgery for Felix. They were really hoping they'd be able to avoid it, but just because of the extent of the dysplasia and the fact that the margins are not super clear, even on like the heavy duty MRI, because of how diffuse it is, they figured going ahead with a two-stage surgery would be the most appropriate. Obviously, even though that sucks because it means like potentially four weeks admitted to the hospital. In a normal situation, they book the surgeries two weeks apart, stage one on the first Monday, and then two Mondays after that, she would go back in and do the actual surgery. So the reason I say like the actual surgery is because the first stage isn't really a surgery in the sense that they're not resecting anything, they're not disconnecting anything. They are simply, simply going in to place electrodes on his brain. It's called a grid. Basically what happens is instead of doing an EEG from the surface, they're gonna put the leads right on the surface of the brain tissue, which allows them to both map where the seizures are coming from, but also to be able to stimulate those areas to see if it causes a seizure. What I was thinking, my impression of everything just based on previous discussions was they go in and they like open up that part of his head and they put like a grid of electrodes on him. No, no. Felix is going for another MRI and a CT scan on March the 8th. The MRI will be with gadolinium. They need the MRI with the gadolinium and the CT scan to program the robot. So the robot is to drill holes in Felix's skull to place the electrodes. So they do not take out a bone flap and put electrodes on. They literally drill holes in his skull and feed the electrodes in and they wrap them up after and hook them up to the monitor. And then we watch him. <laughs> like, what? Pardon? The surgeon says sometimes they do five leads Sometimes they do 20. In Felix's case, she's expecting 12 leads, predominantly located over the frontal, left frontal and left temporal lobes. They will do some, I believe, occipital, and they, at least one on the right side to see if there's any right side leptogenic foci. The goal in this case, as per the neurologist, is less to determine specifically where the seizures are coming from, because they believe it to be quite diffuse in terms of like, they don't think it's a single pinpoint of a spot. They think it's the whole area because all of that tissue is malformed. It will be more so to determine the edges of what they have to remove or disconnect. Surgery will be, in Felix's case, they're anticipating they will be able to do the surgery 10 days later. So if he goes in on a Monday, it would be the next week, Wednesday. Get the information they need and put it all together and come up with a plan, then discuss the plan with us 
and we agree to it or not. The surgery itself, so the second stage when they actually decide to go in and like do whatever they're gonna do, can go one of two ways, possibly three ways. The best case scenario, when they get the information from the grid and from stimulating those areas of his brain, once they figure out specifically what's gonna come out or get disconnected, best case scenario would be it's quite localized to the frontal lobe and they will only have to do a frontal left frontal lobectomy so this whole section of his brain will come out the downside to that if you can call it that really for me it's such a piddly thing is the incision for a frontal lobectomy versus a hemispherectomy is bigger and not as pleasant so it's like uh, what did she say, like here? So it's like a half moon shape here. It would be hidden within his hairline down the road if he goes bald like my dad, it will be visible. Again, who cares? He's already got a huge zigzag going across the top. I'm covered in scars, scars don't bother me. Scars mean you went through something really rough, you came out the other side and you're still trucking. So that all being said, I don't care about the incisions. However, I did want to know like what kind of an incision are we looking at? She said she would try to work it into the the previous incision to like not like overlap crazy. But again, that doesn't really matter. So best case scenario, they're just taking the left frontal lobe. There wouldn't be the expectation of like huge motor deficits. We should expect some regardless of what they do. Best case would be more mild issues that would kind of go away with time as his right brain and the rest of his left brain took over. Other bonuses, regardless of what their surgical route ends up being. This is kind of, it's kind of iffy in the sense that like we don't really know for sure because he's more than just epileptic, he's also autistic and that is fine. Not all autistic people speak. However, we do have hopes because of the fact that Felix does have some words now and he does seem keen on communicating that they would expect once that bad portion of his brain is gone, his, they said that there will probably be a while there where he won't talk, where they're waiting for the right brain to take over. But because that section on the left side is so malformed and not working, they figure a lot of his language is already coming on the right side. It's just kind of fogged up because of what's happening on the left with the seizures. So they do expect that with time, they think, his language will just take off. So that would be, that would be amazing. That would be fantastic. I'm not gonna lie. It's a little scary to me to think that I get to hear him talk now and you can ask him questions and he understands and he does his best to communicate. It's really scary to think that there will be uh, some time in there where he's not talking. And I don't know how long to expect that to be the case, but it's really scary. Worst case scenario, they go in, they do the grid with the, all the electrodes, they stimulate the zones and his motor cortex is involved. The surgeon said, if the motor cortex is not involved, she would suggest just taking the frontal lobe and taking that portion out or disconnecting it because there's a 70% chance it will be successful and we wouldn't be giving him deficits. She said, I would take a 30% non-success with no deficits over major deficits with greater success. The goal is to hit that balance of the least number of deficits introduced but seizure cessation and so if the motor cortex isn't involved they don't think it is based on the mris the motor cortex is not involved the best bet would be a frontal lobectomy left with a decent success expected success rate and very minimal to no deficits introduced worst case is if the motor cortex is involved she would take the entire left side. Whether that means a complete disconnect or a resection, we don't know. I don't know if that will be decided kind of as they see, but if that's the case, he would end up with acute paralysis on the right-hand side and long-term weakness. The bonus is that he is still quite young, he's only four and a half, and they would expect that their right side would eventually manage to take over a little bit. The other downside to a total hemispherectomy, you lose a visual field because they'd be taking out the occipital lobe, which means he would lose vision right of center on both sides. So it's not just an eye. It's not like he take out this side, you lose this eye. Both eyes still see, 
but he would only see center to the left. He wouldn't see to the right. You lose that whole visual field. Sort of like if you ever get auras with migraines and stuff and it goes all like twinkly, that's a visual field. You see it regardless of what eye you close, what eye you open, it's just the side. After the surgeon had left and she was showing us the MRI and everything, she was saying there's the potential that they could possibly do an anterior two-thirds disconnect and try to leave that occipital lobe because they don't think that it's involved. Again, we won't know until they go in and they look at everything. She did say, however, even though a lot of the radiologists that have looked at Felix's MRI images don't think that the motor cortex or the motor strip is involved because of how she says like mild, mild in the sense that um, it's not a very concentrated area. It's such a diffuse zone that's pooched the edges are very hard to delineate, which is why they have to do this two-stage situation. So she said, because of that fact, it's very hard to tell whether or not the motor cortex is involved. So let's hope and pray. <laughs> let's hope and pray that we can go with the more mild option, the less intense surgery, or the less intense kind of like brain fiddling, so that Felix can come out the other side not paralyzed, or not half paralyzed and with the ability to still do the things he loves to do like jump and climb and bounce and have happy hands they suggested like they're gonna try and like get in touch with social work to talk to us our favorite social worker is coming back from maternity leave um, towards the end of march they expect that they again depending on how bad things are and how things go they expect that they would give us probably two months off of work together so Peter and I would both have to go on EI for two months. The downside with that is not like mat leave. It's not like where they top you up to like 84% of what you normally make. Uh, however, your job is secure. So my work has already been uh, massively accommodating for all of these appointments. They know what's going on. As I learn things, I tell them and they just say, you say the word. When you have to go off, you go off. No big deal. I'm probably going to book two weeks of vacation to kind of get us over that hump because then we have to wait before we can apply for EI. I don't know how retroactive it'll be. It's just like one thing after another. So Peter and I will be down to like minimal income while still having to pay for a house and groceries and daycare uh, so we don't lose our daycare spot and before and after school care for Casper and commuting back and forth to the hospital, at least one of us, because one of us will always have to stay with Felix. I'm not breastfeeding anymore, so we'll be able to tag off, do a couple days here, a couple days there. So my amazing friend, it, it definitely took some convincing on her part. I didn't want the, like, I don't like the idea of a GoFundMe page, especially like for, for us. Like on the whole, I think they're an excellent idea, right? When people are really struggling. Right now, mentally struggling. Financially, it's gonna be really tight, like it's gonna be close, but all of my coworkers, my friends, a lot of my family have said, do you wanna know what, if she wants to do it, let her do it. If People will only help if they're able to help because like it's there, there's no obligation. I'm like, that's true. I just feel bad, right? Like you don't wanna be a mooch. You don't wanna like milk a situation because like there are people in a lot worse shape than us. We don't have to pay for his surgery. Like his surgery is covered because it is, I mean, I live in Canada, it's medically necessary because without it, like he's just gonna turn, his brain's just gonna turn to mush. Like I, I couldn't imagine if I had had to pay for his hospitalizations, of which he's had many, his first surgery, and now this other like dual brain surgery with like stage one, stage two, plus a month long hospital stay on top of car payments, house payments, bills, two other kids, right? Like not working or not, I mean, not working, but EI, but only getting like 55% of what you make. I think that's what it's gonna be. I don't even know. Plus Peter having to decrease too. And then like, it'll depend if he ends up having to do rehab. Rehab's done in Toronto. Like there's inpatient rehabilitation. Obviously if it's outpatient or like at home, like private, you'd still have to pay for that. But if it's inpatient, it's done in Toronto. On a good day with no traffic, that's almost a two hour drive. So one of us would have to go. Probably I would have to stay off of work 
Peter would go back to work with reduced hours. Like he wouldn't work Thursdays because our uh, we don't have daycare on Thursdays because I don't work Thursdays. Casper still has school. We're really hoping it doesn't come to that. We will deal if it does, at which point then I would have to stay in Toronto with Felix. We have family there, so that helps. But one of us would always have to be with him. And because my hours are what they are, and I work further away from home than Peter does, with the boys with daycare and school and drop off, it does not make sense for me to be the one to go back to work because like Peter works straight days. I work seven to three, eight to four, uh, the possible nine to five plus weekends plus three to 11 shifts sometimes. Like I'm on three to 11 next week. So it, it just wouldn't work. I'm sure work would be accommodating, but the way our schedule works, like it would be really, really hard. I would basically have to find a coworker who would be always willing to switch with me, which I probably could, but then I would also have to reduce my hours, which Peter wouldn't have to do other than just not working Thursdays. So long story long, so I know this is a lot of uh, talking. Hopefully I've chopped it up a little bit so it's not a full like 20 minutes. Uh, long story long is as of right this moment um, at 20 to three, I do not have an OR date. It is quite possibly going to be March 18th, which is two and a half weeks from now, but it could also possibly be April 15th. My house is much more tidy than when I came home at noon. I tidied up the basement a little bit when I went downstairs to get a card for my camera. I made a smoothie. I had some leftover like fish and chips fish. My counters are clear. My dishes are done. My dishwasher might even be like done washing and on like the drying mode. I brought the recycling out and I, oh, and I finally got around to bissling the floors. So my floors are looking fabulous. That's not gonna last obviously because we will be having dinner tonight and the boys are messy. That's fine, that's life. But I think now, because I have done a lot of talking and I sound like this, <coughs> excuse me. I think what I'm gonna do is take my smoothie my water and myself with a good book and I'm gonna go plop myself in the corner over there and I'm gonna sit and read until I don't even know until I have to go start picking up the boys oh Peter's getting a ride home with Auntie Kendra so Auntie Kendra if you're watching this I love you thank you thank you for the hug this morning and thank you for bringing my PD home so that I don't have to pick up the bean the boys and then drive 20 minutes away from home to go pick up Peter from your house. Um, appreciate it. So friends, yeah, I don't even know how to end this. So I'm just gonna go. Thank you for sticking with me. Thank you for following along on this completely mad hat journey of Felix's brain being scrambled. Hey friends, it's editing Sarah. Um... I've been wearing this shirt as a pajama, so I know it looks like I'm wearing the same clothes and I kind of am, but kind of not. I just wanted to come on and kind of like re-end this video uh, because there have been some changes solid to the day. So surgery has officially been scheduled. Part one is April the 15th. Part two is in a week later, exactly April 22nd. We will have continuation of care throughout. Hopefully our favorite social worker will be back from mat leave because it's April. And um, the, uh, the neurologist has and the surgeon decided to just do one week between surgeries because of um, just of Felix being Felix. So he will be going in. Other things to note, our amazing school is celebrating World um, or International, I'm pretty sure it's International Epilepsy Day on the 26th of March. So if you're, if you're doing anything, wear purple to celebrate. Um, they're gonna have a big assembly for the school and talk about epilepsy and learn more about it. And also the entire school and school community are coming together to um, raise money for Felix and for us as we go through all of this to um, like with gift cards and stuff for groceries and gas and everything to really help out. And I was, I'm working evenings this week or yesterday and today. And that email came out from Felix's teacher when I was like already at work. So I hadn't been checking my email and Peter sent me a message and he was like, Hey, check your email. Good news. And I was like, okay. So I check it and I'm like ugly crying at work almost because just the 
support, the love, and the generosity of our village. It, it's unexpected. Uh, that also brings me to mention, uh, I did mention it in the video earlier, but um, I'm going to put a link in the description box below to the GoFundMe page that my most amazing best friend put together. And I did touch on it, but I'll just say, uh, I didn't know if I wanted to go the GoFundMe route. Like I said, there are people in significantly worse shape than we are in that have to pay for surgery and hospital stays on top of all of the other stuff. And the world is really tough right now, financially speaking. Um, and we have been saving as best as we can for this, but you know, everything's expensive. So trying to save up is really, really hard. And so my friend went out of her way to put together this GoFundMe. She didn't even tell me because she, she knew I wasn't really sure about it um, and didn't want to come off as, as needy and greedy and all that. And uh, I just told her, do you want to know what? Like, if, if you feel like it's a good idea, let's do it. And she was like, I already have it ready to go. She went through my entire Instagram to get all the information so she didn't have to badger me about it, about like diagnosis and first surgery and everything. She went through it all on her own and she made it live and she has been going through and messaging people and sending out links and giving me updates because I try not to look at it because I it's like you don't want to get your hopes up, but we blasted through the... Um, the goal she had set within like four days and it's been shared so many times. And so if you're watching this and, and you feel like sharing it, uh, I don't expect anyone on YouTube to donate, right? Like that's not why I do this. This is a creative outlet for me, but, um, even if you just share it, right? Like to my sister, if you watch this, I don't know if you watch my videos, but if you do, um, thank you for stepping up. Thank you for being, um, so thoughtful and for really, you know, pushing it to whoever you can to make it known. Um, to Laura, thank you. I don't have words. I really don't. To uh, every single person who has already donated, I'm going to cry. Um, because it's just... Ooh, it's like, you know, karma, people always say like karma is a bitch, right? And, and it is, but it goes the other way too. And I like to think that, you know, I go out of my way to help people when I can financially, but to also be, you know, happy and helpful. And like, I, I love people. I gen, I just genuinely do. And so it's, you never really expect that it's going to come back to you like that and that's not why you do it right you don't you just try and be a good person and try and really help out where you can and try to make everybody's day just a little bit happier um and just the fact that it's like I'm crying now just the fact that it's come back to us in such a such a supportive way and to just know that everybody is looking out for us and everybody cares so much um Oh, thanks. Just thanks. So, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna officially end this video here. I know it's a long one and I, I do hope that you've watched to the end. Um, thank you. We'll keep you posted. I'm taking Felix on Friday for his, um, MRI and CT scan. Uh, so, yeah. I really wish it didn't have to come to this, but knowing that all of you are behind us and rooting for us and sending all the happy brain thoughts to our sweet kaboom is, uh, it's helping us push through. So 